All right, hey, everybody, let's do it like we do every week. Let's welcome all of our friends who have joined us online today. God bless you. And uh, today we're going to start a brand new series. It's going to be on the Ten Commandments. You know, thousands of years ago, God gave ten values to humanity to serve as a strong foundation for our lives and even as a foundation for civil societies uh, on this planet. Uh, They are truly God's top ten lists. We call them the Ten Commandments. The Scripture describes them as the commands of God for our lives. And they really, what they are, are values that when we live them out can be transformative in our lives as well as our culture. These aren't fads. Uh, These are truly uh, foundational, timeless truths that have been historically the foundation of Western civilization These truths are what are at the foundation of our judicial and legal system, uh, really across Western societies across the world. And actually, I don't know if you realize that the Ten Commandments are really the only thing that Jews, Christians, and Muslims can actually all agree on. They all believe in in these truths. Now, Jews and Christians, uh, our God is different from the God of Islam, Allah. They are not the same but it's amazing how all of those religions can, can uh, agree on the values that we see given to us by Almighty God. So for, th- for these next 10 weeks, we're going to take time and examine uh, these truths, these values, these commands of God. And we're going to talk about how they truly make a difference in our lives and serve as a foundation for our society. And I truly believe, especially now, with the events that we see taking place in our world, uh, that these are just critically important truths for us to revisit and reapply to all of our lives. So uh, I want us just to be reminded of what the book of Deuteronomy says. It says, never forget these commands that I'm giving you. Teach these to your children. So God is saying these are of such priority that you not only need to base your life upon these truths, remember them, but teach them. Pass them on. Pour them into your children, into the next generation, because it's really truly a foundation for life. Now, why why did God give us these Ten Commandments? He gave them to us to help us, not to hurt us, not to punish us. He gave us these commandments to protect us. See, when you tell your child, hey, don't touch that hot stove, are you telling them that for your benefit or for their benefit? Right? For their benefit. You're trying to help them, not not hurt them. And every time God says don't, every time God has a a prescription, a specific thing that he says don't do, the whole idea is that he wants to help us, not to hurt us. And when you and I ignore the commands of God, just like that stubborn, headstrong kid who ignores their parents and reaches up to the hot stove, you know, any time we ignore the commands of God, we hurt, hurt ourselves. Anytime a society abandons the guidelines, the truths, the commands of God, those societies suffer. So what God has done in this world is he's established both physical and spiritual laws that govern, that are the foundation for everything. He has organized the universe by, first of all, these universal physical laws, laws like the law of gravity. And if you ignore the law of gravity, you only hurt yourself. You step out the window of a 10-story building, you can violate the law and break the law, but guess what? The law breaks you, right? This is not a very pleasant feeling when you hit the ground 10 stories high. So when you violate those, those physical laws, you and I suffer. Likewise, with spiritual laws that God has established. These are not 10 suggestions. These are the 10 commandments. They're not optional. God says, do these things, and things will go well for you. If you don't do these things, you're only hurting yourself and you're going to suffer as a result. And it's really interesting that psychiatrists back in the 60s were saying how good it is to have no boundaries and just do whatever you want and sleep with whoever you want and just no boundaries are what's really healthy for people. Well, now 30 years later, 40 years later, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists are reanalyzing that whole idea And they're saying, oh, you know what? Actually, we need boundaries. They're good for our emotional and and mental health. And it seems like our society is kind of going full circle. We're rediscovering the need for foundational values 
a clear sense of right and wrong that we built our lives upon, we built our, 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 our civilized society upon, and we, we need to come back to those, especially in the days that, that we're living in. So today we're going to look at this foundation for a strong and stable life, and we're going to start by looking at the very first commandment. By the way, the order that the Ten Commandments were given are not just random. God gave the first commandment and made it first for a reason because it really is the priority of all of the other commandments. What is that commandment? I want us to all read it out loud together from Exodus 20, verse 2. Come on, let's say it out loud. You shall have no other gods before me. So what is the principle here? When God gives us his command, have no other gods before me, he, he's really saying the principle is to put God first. For us to put God first in our lives, in our family, in our priorities, in the way we, we do business, the way we live our lives. God is saying, listen, I'm not going to be second place to anything. How many of you believe that God deserves to be number one in our lives? Do you believe that? The reason why he deserves that first place in our lives is that he made everything. He made you. He's the owner. He, he created all things. Everything you have in your life is because God gave it to you. He gave you life. He's allowing all these things in our lives, and they're all gifts from God. Now, when you look in the Bible and we, we read that command, it says, we shall have, you should have no other gods before me. You'll see in your Bibles that that's the small g. God. There aren't many gods out there, and the Bible's not teaching that there are many gods. What God is saying is that anything in our lives that we put first place in our lives can become a God in our life. Anything that dominates or controls our life can become a God. And God is saying there should not be anything in our lives that comes before Him, right? Can a career become a God to us? Yeah, it can. Can another person become a God to us? Can a hobby? You know, even good things, if we give them first place that only God deserves, it can become a God to us. And let me remind you, anytime anything else or anyone else is in that first place in our lives, we are the ones who suffer when God's not first. We're only hurting ourselves. You know, Gene and I, in the 30 years that we've been married together, we have built two houses. Twice, uh, we've had the opportunity, the blessing to build a home. And one of the really cool things about seeing a house built was, you, is you see all the stages. The really frustrating phase that really takes the most patience is the very first phase of it. And that's all the site preparation and, you know, digging the footers and all the stuff, getting the slab ready. Now, this isn't one of our houses. It's just a generic photo. But you get the idea. There's all the things that go into a foundation. Feels like it takes forever for all that to be done before the walls go up. But once that foundation is laid, man, things just start taking shape really, really quickly. And what, even though I was frustrated and impatient, every single time that we'd go through that really slow phase at the very, very beginning, um, it's very time-consuming. It took a lot of energy. And when you see it, when it's done, it's like, man, there's not a whole lot to show for all that time and effort. It just looks like a big flat piece of concrete. But the fact is, it was actually the most important part of the building. If the foundation is wrong... If the foundation is not solid, it doesn't matter how beautiful the structure is that you build on it, it's going to fall over. It's going to have major problems down the line. And I began to realize that although it's not the most glamorous part of building a home, it's the most important part of building a home. And man, can we ever see this truth in our society today? Anytime we see societal unrest and instability, it's often an issue of going back to an unstable foundation. And right now we kind of see a society that's uh, kind of teetering, kind of on the edge. Why? It's because I think for a few generations now, we've been building a society on the wrong values, on, on a foundation that is not God's foundation. And it's been a weak foundation. And today I want to look at these foundations, uh, begin this study of these God's foundations in our lives, and, and this, this priority of putting God first. Every time God gives us a principle, he gives us a promise. 
And when he says, listen, the principle is I want you to put me first, what's the promise that he gives us? It's success. Is there anybody in this room who would like to have a successful life? Anybody? Is there? I'm just looking. Yeah, I've got a couple of you. How many of you will never raise your hand in church ever under any circumstance? Okay, yeah, okay. So let's look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 6. Can we read this one out loud together as well, everybody? Come on, read it with me. In everything you do, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. See, so the criteria for the blessing of success is putting God first. Is he first? See, whatever area of your life you want God to bless, you got to put God first in that area. Now, how do we actually practically do this? What does it look like to put God first in my life? We're going to use the word first as an acrostic, and we're going to deal with five foundational areas. When we put God first in these areas, then we're going to fundamentally be putting God first in our life. F, the first way we put God first is in our finances. I mean, let's come right out of the gate and deal with one of the more challenging ones, right? Put God first in your finances. Here's what Proverbs says. Honor the Lord by giving him the the first part of your income, and he will fill your barns to overflowing. See, this is an agrarian society where their wealth, their monetary system was all based on on the things that they had stored in barns, their livestock, the things that they would grow. And God is saying, put me first in your life. Put me first in your finances, and I will bless you with all the rest that you need. The Bible says, the Bible teaches that money is the number one test of our priorities. We spend the most of our time, you know, trying to earn it. Our lives tend to revolve around our money. And really, God is saying that your checking account, my checking account, that transaction register reveals what's truly important in my life. I'm not talking about what we say is most important in our lives, but what is actually more important, what we spend, where we spend our money reveals our priorities more accurately than anything else. So let me ask you, what does your checking account reveal in terms of God being first in your life? This is just important for us to think about. The way that we spend our money is really determines what's first in our lives. And here's what the Bible teaches in Deuteronomy 14. It says the purpose of tithing. Tithing is that first 10% of our income. Purpose of it is to teach you to what? Put God first. That's what we're talking about. God's saying not have any other gods before me. Put me first in your life. Finance is a key area, and the tool that God has given us for establishing God as first in our finances is the tithe, the first 10%. He's saying it's to teach you to put God first in your lives. So God has actually said in the scripture that first 10% of our income, if I'm a Jesus follower, it actually belongs to God. I return it back to God in an act of worship. The purpose of it is to simply teach us that God is first in our finances. And obviously, we're in sluggish economic times right now in response to this coronavirus. Uh, There are a number of people here in our church who absolutely have been financially affected by what has happened. And regardless, in our lives, one of the, the clearest, best pieces of advice I can give you as a pastor who truly cares about you is if your finances are in a struggle area right now, the best first step is to put God first in your finances. Because that is the way that we put ourselves in a position to experience God's blessing in that area. So whatever you want God to bless, put him first in that area. So God says, not Dave, God says that if I'm not tithing, he's really not first in my life. Because he's not first in this real fundamental area. So that's why the Bible says on the first day of each week, right, on, on a Sunday, that first day of the week, which is the tradition of the, 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 book, the book of Acts church, the original first church, was the first day of the week. They would come together and they would bring their tithe, their offering to God as an act of worship. So that first Sunday after my paycheck is my opportunity to worship God with my tithe. And we do it on Sunday because it is an act of worship. It's good to give to other charities, but that's not tithing. Tithing is an act of worship in my local church. That's an act of putting God first 
in my life. Second area of putting God first in our lives is in our interests. In our interests. See, if God's really going to be number one, we need to put him first in our interests. That means our fun times, our recreational times, our play times, our hobbies. Well, how do we do that? First Corinthians says, whatever you do, do it all for God's glory. Do it all for God's glory. Did you know that you can go on vacation for the glory of God? Did you know you can work out for the glory of God? Did you know that you can eat for the glory of God? You can go fishing for the glory of God. Guys, can you say amen, all right? You say, well, how, how in the world do I do those things for, for the glory of God? Well, the way you do that is put God first in that activity with an attitude of gratitude and worship, and everything we do can be an expression of worship and gratitude to God. So if you're fishing, you can just be out there saying, Lord, I just want to thank you for this beautiful day, this beautiful morning, this beautiful evening to get out here. God, I just want to thank you that you've given me uh, the physical ability to hold this rod and this reel, that, that my arms work good and I'm healthy enough to get out here. God, I want to thank you, you know, for the eye-hand coordination. I want to thank you for this boat. I want to thank you for, for just the, the beauty of your creation. See, whatever activity we find ourselves in, we can do it for the glory of God when we just thank him and recognize him and, and basically do it as an expression of, of worship to God. And so this is just fundamental when it comes to putting God first in our lives. The book of Ephesians says, talk with each other much about the Lord. So even in our conversations, we can honor God and put God first. And you know what? You can see someone's priorities pretty quickly by what they get really excited about. You know, what you get excited about is what you're, you know, it's most important to you. What do you talk about the most? Some people, when you talk to them, they'll spend hours talking to you about other people, but they won't, you know, spend, you know, five minutes talking about God. When he's first in your life, make God a part of your conversations to where, you know, we're not ashamed to just talk about the good things that God is doing in our lives. Make him a part of our interests. R, the way we can put God first is in our relationships also. This is a huge one. If you want God to be first in your life, you have to choose your friends very, very carefully. Proverbs 27 Again, it's fundamental to this. It says, what a man is really like is shown by the kind of friends that he chooses. And, you know, what do my friends have to do with God being first in my life? Well, it has a lot to do with it, actually, because the people that you spend the most time with, you're going to become like those people. If you spend the most time with people who take God lightly, what you're going to find is you're going to take God less and less seriously just by spending more and more time around people who are wired that way. But if you spend the majority of your time with people who take God's word seriously, then you're going to find in your life that that attitude is kind of contagious. You're going to become a more committed, a more stronger uh, Christian. So whoever you spend the most time with, is really who you're going to be, be like. So we have to be very cautious. And I'll just say it this way. Some relationships are dead wrong for you if you want God to be first in your life. And I've often seen dynamic Christians get pulled off track by a relationship. Often it's a dating relationship. And they want to be with someone, they don't want to be alone, or they want to get married. And so they invest themselves in a person who doesn't share God's values, and all of a sudden, before long, they're being pulled away in that relationship. You can just see the spiritual life being sucked out of them. Before you know it, they're sleeping together, they're out of church, they're, they're, their life is going in a completely opposite direction. And again, that spiritual strength is just, just sapped out of their life. So we need to choose our friendships and our relationships very carefully and put God first in our relationships. S, put God first in our schedules. This is how we know God is first in our lives, by putting him first in our schedules, first in our time. Uh, the book of Ephesians 5 says, make the best use of your time. Grasp firmly what you know to be the will of the Lord. So how do I put God first in my schedule? 
things. You're doing that right now today by just being here on the first day of the week. You're saying the first part of our week, I'm putting God first. I'm going to be in his house with his people, and I'm going to worship God. I'm going to open myself to the, the teaching of God's word. I'm going to be in fellowship with other Christians. That's part of the way we put God first. Another way we put God first is to establish a daily quiet time with God. I put God first in my time when I take the first part of each day and say, Lord, I'm going to spend a little time talking to you in prayer. Let you speak to me through your word. And I'm going to ask you to guide me with all the stuff that I need to do today. I don't want to just do good things. I want to do God things. I want to, I want to prioritize everything that, you know what? I, I have time to do everything, God, that you want me to do today. So you lead my steps. You guide my direction. You help me in all my decisions and, and show me what your plan is. You know, Jesus found the need to pray and spend uh, consistent time with his father. How many of you know that if Jesus needs that, you and I need that, all right? We, we absolutely need that. And we can see in Mark 135, very early in the morning, Jesus got up and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I told you guys, my daily quiet time is over breakfast. I have my, my little Bible app on my phone. I have a reading plan. I read through my stuff. I spend time in prayer and my entire commute on my way to the office, no radio, no other distractions, quiet in the car. I just worship and I talk to God. And I, I just focus that first part of my day every day for God to direct me. Every single one of us can do that. We can take the first 15 minutes at least of our day and establish God as first in our time and his schedule. So it's, you know, first day of the week in worship, first part of my day, and then just simply saying, God, would you guide me? Would you lead me? Help me to walk in wisdom today. Praying over our, our list of appointments and things to do and say, God, you guide and direct me. And there's, a, there's another way we can put God first, and that is in our troubles. Anybody ever have any troubles in their lives? <laughs> Two or three of you? Yeah, I think a few of us do. Uh, when you face problems and pressures and even crisis, can I ask you, who do you turn to? How do you respond to those things? For many people, prayer has become the last resort. When I have problems, man, I need to figure it out. I need to deal with it. I need to do this and do that. It's like, and prayer is like, in case of emergency, break glass. It's like the very last option uh, when things get really, really, really bad. But see, prayer should not be our last resort. It truly should be our first option. That's how we put God first. And guys, when we see all the violence and division and, and injustice in our society, it's crazy how often we tend to look first to political remedies to these types of societal problems. Has anyone learned by now that government, government is not the answer to our problems? Hello? Maybe, just maybe, government is a big part of our problems. I would like to suggest that that very well may be the case, but that's just my opinion. But we need to understand that God wants to be our first option when we're facing problems and crises. He's an ever-present help in time of need. Book of Psalms says, yeah, trouble. All right, Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. So call upon him. Make, make that our first option. Some people are like, well, I'm embarrassed, you know, to talk to God. I don't really talk to God much throughout the, I don't want to bother God with my problems. God is saying, no, it's not a bother. Bring it to me. Don't carry that yourself. And the way we put God first is to learn to make him our very first option with every challenge that comes across our path. Worry is that warning light that, Maybe God's not first in this area. It's like that little check engine light in your car. Hey, there, there might be a problem here you need to check out. Worry is an indicator that maybe we're kind of playing God. Maybe we're assuming responsibility for things that are out of our control. And, and when God's not first in these five areas, we tend to worry about them. When God's not first in my finances, I tend to worry about my finances. When God's not first in my relationships, I tend to worry about my relationships. When God's not first in my problems, my trials, my troubles, I tend to worry about them. When God's not first in my schedule, I tend to worry about my schedule and all the things I got to get done today. But when I stop 
and I do a priority check. And I say, God, I want you to be number one in my life. You can handle it. You're in charge. I give it to you. When I make God my first priority, all of a sudden, I can step back. I can relax. I can take a deep breath and know that God's got everything under control. I love Matthew 6.33. I think it's on your outline, but we don't have a slide for it. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, put God first in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. All the stuff you need, all of the things that you desire, whatever those things are, and God knows better than you and I what those things are and what they should be. Seek God first. Put God first. And he says, all those other things I'm going to take care of. By the way, Jesus, Jesus, not Gina, Jesus Jesus and my wife Gina, yeah, they are pretty much the same. (laughs) But, But Jesus said this, Matthew 6, 33, in the middle of a teaching about worry. Seek first the kingdom of God. Put God first in your life. And it's going to reduce that level of stress and worry in your life significantly. So if you want to build uh, a successful life, a strong life, you want a strong family, if we want a strong civil society, pass on to our kids a stable, healthy future, we've got to have the right foundation. And we got to start by putting God first. I love Joshua's commitment in scripture for him and his family. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And I want to challenge every man, every woman in this room to say, you know what, God, regardless of all the voices and all the other priorities and all the other ways for people to go, I'm establishing you as number one, my primary priority in my life. Put him first and you won't regret it. Let's pray together. Bow your heads with me, everybody. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, we just open our hearts to you. Everybody, just with your heads bowed and eyes closed, the right thing for your life, the right thing for your family, the right thing for our society and our nation is to say, I'm not ashamed to build my life on God's values, on God's commands. Today, if you're here and you say, you know what, I want to establish my life on God's truth. I want to put him first in my life. I want to invite you just to pray a prayer from your heart. And Father, today we just want to ask you to help us to walk in faith, to trust you in all of these areas. We tend to take hold of them. We take the hang, tend to hang on to them and we'll stress out and worry about them because it's, sometimes it can be a fearful thing to just trust you. But that's where our faith needs to grow for many of us. All of us can stand to grow in some way. So Lord, we put you first in our finances. Why did you say 10%? You didn't tell us why you said 10%. You just said that that's the foundation for putting you first. So God, give us the courage and the faith to honor you. Lord, put you first in our, we put you first in our interests. We want to make everything we do a way that we express our praise and our worship, our gratitude to truly give you glory in all that we do. God, we want you first in our relationships. Help us to carefully evaluate our relationships. Help us as parents to carefully guide our children in in the, the establishment of their relationships. Because those relationships have a powerful influence. Lord, I just pray you give us wisdom. Some of us are in in a wrong dating relationship today. Some of us are in an inappropriate relationship with someone who is not our spouse and emotionally it's gone just a little bit out of bounds. Lord, I pray that you'd you'd just give us wisdom, help us to make course corrections and to honor you. God, in all of our troubles, I know there are needs here in this, this congregation that are just heartbreaking. You know what's going on in our families and in our lives. I pray that, Lord, you would wrap your arms of love are on every hurting heart today. As they fight their own private battle in some area, I pray that you just remind them today that they are not alone. God, we want to seek you first when when things are hard. We want to look to you first when we're dealing with troubled waters. 
We thank you that when we call out to you, that you are that ever-present help. Sometimes you pull us out of it. Other times you just take a hold of us and you walk us through it. And you get us to the other side. God, I pray that you would have your way and that each of us as your sons and daughters, we would look to you today. And Lord, if there's even one person who's never opened their heart to establish you as their, their Lord, their King, their Master, pray this would be that moment. My friends, if you're here and you've never truly established Jesus as the Lord of your life, that's really what that phrase means. Making him Lord means that he's first. What he says goes. His words are authoritative. They're not an option. They're not a suggestion. But he gives the command and we say, yes, sir. And our lives are blessed as a result. If you need to make that step today, God sees your heart. He knows your life. In your own heart, you can just make that decision and say, God, I'm, I'm establishing you as first. I accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. I confess my faults, my sins. God, I need your forgiveness. So come into my life. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for his love today? Come on, put your hands together.